sacrifice. I want to ask you to read something with me in Isaiah 51, verse 6 through 8. I want you to think tonight about what are you looking at and what do you see when you look out in this world. There's a lot of times when we have things in this world that distract us from seeing what God wants us to see. We see a lot of things. The question is, are we seeing the right things? When you, lead, when you read this passage with me, I want you to think about what does God want us to see? If you remember what it says in the book of Proverbs, God said, where there is no vision, people perish. Now, does God have a vision? John 3.16 tells us he does. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. God has a plan and a way for people to not perish. But for that plan to work, that gospel of the death and burial and resurrection of Christ has to be gotten to all those people, has to be delivered. And he wants to use not some angel, but you. Think about the fact that when God wanted to reach this man named Cornelius, who was a very devout man, he was even trying to give alms and do lots of good things. God sent him an angel, but the angel didn't tell him the gospel. God said, now the angel is going to tell you where to find Peter. And you go over there and get Peter, because I want Peter to come and tell him. Why? God takes a saved sinner to go tell another not saved sinner so he can be saved. God wants to use us that he's transformed to help those get transformed. He wants them to see this physical example of what the power of God can do. You know, I usually like to look at something like this and say, this is somebody put this together. And they put it together so people would marvel at the beautiful colors. God takes your life and this is his power to transform you into something that others will marvel at. The Bible even says that they think it's strange that we don't run back with them to that same dark things that we used to do. I mean, I grew up here in Milan, and sadly to say, I was a hooligan. Uh, we have a pastor over there right now. He has wrote his testimony tract, and it's called Hooligan. But I was a hooligan. Brother Tom never was one that had to pull me over. But... Um, <laughs> I only had one time when I got stopped by a policeman. It wasn't actually, I was sitting and we were, I don't know, we were getting ready for a math exam, drinking beer. It was stupid. But, and he, he stopped me and he asked us to pour them all out. But um, I, was a, I was a crazy fool for myself. I served sin because I loved it. Didn't you? That was what satisfied our flesh. But today, my life is different. Why? Because one day I understood the, God, understood the gospel. Actually, what helped me the most is I had four people, four men at church tell me their, their testimony. They explained it to me between Sunday school and uh, the preaching hour at church. They just sat back there and explained to me, got me alone and we talked, and they told me how they got saved. And then on a Thursday night over here on 700 North, which used to be Oak Tree Road, at the end there where Bob Weil lives, he's my, he was my neighbor, my uncle. And right there, God said, if you don't repent, you're going to perish. I got on my knees and asked the Lord to save me. Why? Because I understood it already. Why? Because brothers had explained it to me. I was an exception. I came to church, and I heard the gospel there at church. Most of them are never going to come through those doors. As a young Catholic fellow, there was no reason why I should have come to church. If it wouldn't have been for the fact that um, I'd gotten disappointed with the Catholic church, seeing the priest smoking and drinking and doing everything that I was doing as a lost man and thinking, why am I confessing my sins to this fellow? If it wasn't for that, I probably would have continued in the church. And then finally I saw my, through my girlfriend's family that they were getting help from a, a Southern Baptist preacher who was over here in Morris Hill area. And they were getting help for their family. And I realized these Baptists actually care. They care about people. I hope they would say that about you. But because of that, we started to think, well, let's go check out the Baptist church. And it's because of that, we ended up going to the Baptist church. And Sister Wilma over here is one of the, we went with her the first time to Berean Baptist Church for a revival. 
Uh, Brother Brian McBride was preaching. Many of you know him because I know he preaches here now, and I'm glad for that. There's better evangelists. I don't know that there are any, but I'm thankful for him. And uh, I didn't actually get saved, but I thought, well, he's a good evangelist, so I guess I'll stick around next week, see, see if the preacher's any good. So I continued going to church, even though I wasn't understanding a lot of it, and I was even reading the Bible for half a year before that, but I wasn't getting much from it. It wasn't a King James either, but it was NIV New Testament from the Gideons. But sadly to say, I wasn't getting a lot because, you know, the lost man receiveth not. The natural man can't receive the things of the Spirit of God because they're spiritually discerned and he can't, can't receive them. But once you get saved, God opens it all up to you. I was trying to re read the book of Revelation to understand all those things. But our job is not to condemn people or just tell them, read the Bible. That's great. But even that Ethiopian eunuch, remember, he was reading the Bible. And Jesus had just been crucified over there in Jerusalem. It had just happened not too long before that. This is Acts chapter 8. And here he's reading the Bible, and he don't have any idea what it's talking about. He says, how can I understand this except some man guide me? And you and I are not blind leaders of the blind. We're those that finally have their eyes open. And we understand truth. So we're now supposed to lead those blind people to Christ. We're supposed to help them understand. I'll give you a, a, a sad joke. Well, I shouldn't. It's a joke. I shouldn't do that. Some preachers start out with jokes, but... Well, it's about the Baptist puppies. You know what they are? They were Catholics last week when the priest came by. But 10 days later, when the priest came by again, he said, those are puppies. You told me they were Catholic. He said, well, now they're Baptists because they got their eyes open. But <clears throat> he was pretty embarrassed because he brought his buddy by to brag about these are Catholic puppies. But uh, there's a lot of religion does blind people. I believe one thing that Lenin said, and he said it right. He said, religion, religion is the opium for people. If you look around today, most people, a lot of people are on drugs or an alcohol or something, and they're not, they don't even care about eating. They don't care about anything. They just drink and drink. They ruin their health. They ruin their life. They ruin their body. I have a cousin who died because of drugs. And when you see that, you realize they don't need anything but their drug. They think that's what they need. And that's what religion teaches them. Religion makes them satisfied. They're not looking for anything because they got a relationship with a church. A relationship with a God that that church represents. But it's not always the true God. And that's the saddest thing. Religion, not all roads lead to heaven, that's for sure. Not everything is going to give people the truth. Don't expect that those people that you know, your neighbors that go to church, that they're getting the gospel that they understand it. I had a neighbor out here on Old Milan Road that I, I went to witness to him, but he said he'd already, he was already saved. But he said, I've been going to the Methodist church here for seven years and I've never once heard him explain the gospel. Can you imagine that, seven years? They never even once said, hey, you need to get saved, come on, we'll help you. They never explain the need for salvation. Why? Because they become a social club. This world is full of religions. And who's going to lead them out of those? God, using you, not using only me. I'm over there with the false religion over there they have. But you're over here. And there's a lot of false religions right here. In Milan, why didn't, why didn't we choose a church in Milan? Well, we didn't know much about hope. But there was only one American Baptist church that wasn't really preaching the gospel here then. There was another one that was a Baptist brider. And so Sister Wilma said, nowhere to go. And so we finally ended up going down to Berean when that was the only place that was closest that had the gospel. And so it's sad, but that's the case. There's not always a good place. Now there's Lighthouse Baptist down there. There's a, and you guys are doing a great job. But God has us here as lighthouses to be, shine, but not just shine in here. To shine out there. Because they need to see that there's rocks and they're in the rocky religions that aren't going to take them to heaven. They're going to end up in, the Bible calls it shipwrecked. They're going to end up dying and perishing and going to hell. And how many have you led to Christ is the question I guess I have to ask you. How many people are saved today because of you? 
I'm not saying you saved them. But how many people have you influenced? How many people have you sown the seed in their heart? I'm not just saying you gave them a tract. You sowed the gospel. You told them the truth. And we're going to get to that in just a minute because Ephesians chapter 1 is a very clear passage about that. And I want you to read with me verse 13 in just a minute. But first I want you to get God's perspective on what he sees when he looks down on this earth. Isaiah 51 verse 6, he says to us to lift up your eyes to the heavens and look upon the earth beneath. Why? Why are we looking down at all these things? Because God wants us to show everything is temporal. He says, for the heavens shall vanish away like smoke, and the earth shall wax old like a garment, and they that dwell therein shall die in like manner. That's pretty glim, pretty, you know, sad statement. God looks down from up there and he says, everything that you see down there is going to burn. Everything that you see down there is going to perish. But... Think about it. What is eternal? What can give an eternal change? He says, but my salvation shall be forever and my righteousness shall not be abolished. The only thing that's eternal of all that we see is God's salvation. And if you're saved today, you have the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what gives you the right to go into heaven. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, but now through the blood of Christ we're cleansed from our sins, and now we're able to go into the presence of God and be with him for eternity. But that's all because we were paid for and bought with that price of Christ. He says, my salvation shall be forever, and my righteousness shall not be abolished. Verse 7 says, hearken unto me, ye that know righteousness, that's you and me, the people in whose heart is my law, fear ye not the reproach of men. How often are we afraid to talk to people? How often are we fearful how they're going to react? I don't want to offend them. Better to offend them now than later have them offended that you didn't tell them. One of my most touching songs that I've ever heard is this girl singing out of hell and saying, I can't believe I called you my friend because you never told me what could have kept me from being in this place. We, we walked and talked and laughed and did all these things in life, but you never told me, the, basically the gospel, that would have kept me from ending up here in hell and torments. That truck touched my heart. I've heard it since then another time in Texas. But it's really sad to me that many Christians, their friends would be singing that to them. How many of your friends have you not told the gospel to? I hope you can't count them. I hope you can say that I've told them all. Paul tried to be, he said, I'm clean from the blood of all men. He tried to tell everybody. He tried to reach them all with the gospel. I invited quite a few to come tonight, sadly to say, like the marriage feast. That one went there, that one went there, this one had that going on, this one had that going on. I don't know if any of them got married, but they all found a reason why they didn't get here tonight. That happens. Some of them are relatives, some of them were friends, classmates that I haven't seen for, really seen for 37 years since we graduated in 1985, actually 39 years almost. But it's sad that, actually tomorrow night, one of them that couldn't come, she wants me to come and talk to her and tell her the gospel. She actually wanted me to baptize her. That's because she doesn't understand that salvation is not in baptism, but she really wants me to give her the gospel tomorrow night. So pray, praise God for that. Tomorrow around 5 o'clock, I'll start witnessing to one of my classmates. Her name is Melissa. But I'm um, glad that uh, she's, she finally hit the end of her rope and she wants to know the truth. And that's sad that we, have, we often don't find those people. I mean, I've been in and out of Bright for three years and she was right down the road. But maybe she wasn't ready yet. Finally, when I invited her to come here tonight, she started writing and corresponding with me and telling me, I really need to come and talk. I need to talk to you. I really need you to visit more than you know. She's willing to pay for a hotel if it need to be, but I said I'll live right beside you about 20 minutes away. So I'm glad that God's opening doors and hearts for people that do, do seek the Lord. But you know what? If we don't reach out to them, they're not going to know we care. And they really don't want, don't want to know how much you know until they know how much you care. That's the reality of it all. We think, well, I told them. Well, if you tell them with the wrong spirit, he says, speak in the truth and love, then it'd be received. But even sometimes they're not ready when we try to tell them. 
Sometimes they'll close the door today, but in a while, God will say, go. And you'll say, well, I already tried. But God doesn't want you to give up. God knows right now they're seeking. Now they're ready. I have testimonies from guys over there in Ukraine that tell me their regrets when they missed opportunities, when God told them to go and they didn't go till later. One guy said, you know, God showed me, he said, you need to go talk to so-and-so. And I said, well, it's no one out there. Lord, I'll go in the morning. He went in the morning, but the guy was frozen to death. And we don't realize we could be used of the Lord, and we will be if we'll be obedient and go when and where he tells us to go. He'll use us in a mighty way. If he'd have rescued him from death, don't you think he'd have been thankful? He'd have listened to him. He probably would have got saved. But you know what? That brother still to this day regrets missing that opportunity. And I believe that's what we'll have in heaven, regrets for the things we didn't do more than the things we did do. Because as Christians, we're trying not to do those things we used to do, right? Because we're living now for the Lord. But we're going to regret the things we didn't do when we should have done what God wanted us to do. This passage says to not fear their reproach. Fear ye not the reproach of men, neither be ye afraid of their revilings. They might even say, yeah, shut up. I don't want to hear that. Stop. But don't be afraid of that. That doesn't mean don't respect them. But don't be afraid of how they're going to react because that's not our responsibility. Our responsibility is to give them the gospel, give them the truth, and speak the truth to them in love, and God will do the work in their heart. And it says, for verse 8, For the moth shall eat them up like a garment, and the worm shall eat them like wool. But, again, there's another but, but my righteousness shall be forever, and my salvation from generation to generation. So God wants us to do what the next verse says, awake, awake. Wake up. Wake up and see, God wants to use me. Just He wants to use you personally. He has a plan. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, right? And that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. That's salvation, but that's just the beginning. But from that point on, God says, Now you're my workmanship. Remember, God created the earth in seven, six days, and he rested on the seventh but then again, after Jesus came, when Jesus came, he said, ye shall be born again. He started making new creatures. There were no new creatures before Christ came. Now you and I are new creatures in Christ. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Our old life has passed away. Behold, all things have become new and all things are of God. Who hath reconciled us unto himself and given us a ministry of reconciliation. Like I said, I used to live for sin. But then I met the cross, found out what Christ did for me. And now I'm crucified with Christ. And it's no longer I that live. I don't live for sin like I used to. But it's Christ that lives in me. And the life which I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I'm not here for me anymore. And this life isn't for us. If you listen to Joel Olstein, all those idiots on the television, they say your best life now. They just have God as a little crutch, a little helper, a genie to help them through life. Try all these, practice all these biblical things and live a life kind of with God so you can live better. That's not God's plan. God wants to live his life through us. You know, Jesus Christ said it was finished that day, but he finished the redemption. But that doesn't mean the work is over. The work continues through you and me. He lives in us. And he said when he gave us that great commission because there's a great harvest, because there's very few laborers, he said, go ye therefore and teach all nations. Why? Because they need to hear the gospel. And he said, I'll go with you. Lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the earth. Jesus is the one taking the gospel to those people through us if we're going. Question is, are we? Are we willing? Are we wanting? I know you're the cream of the crop. You're the ones that are here Sunday night. That's great. But you know what? I've gone to church before and been cold. Coming to church, listening to preaching, but not hearing and not listening. You ever done that? I bet you could also you had a season like that. But you know, it's time to wake up out of sleep, he said. Because now is our salvation closer than when we believed. I mean, right now, Jesus is coming. Each day is closer and closer. We can win more before the final shout. But the question is, are we going to? Do we have a vision for that? 
He wants us to get his vision. Look at that verse 6 again one more time. Lift up your eyes where? To the heavens. Get them up here. And he said, and now look. Look upon the earth beneath. He wants us to get his perspective, what he sees. He sees everything down here is going to perish and the people too. The only thing that's going to last is his righteousness and his salvation. So what do these people need down here? What does this earth need? It needs God's salvation and his righteousness. And we're the ones that have it. We're the ones that know righteousness, the next verse says. And we're the ones that God's put things in our heart. We can take those to the world and give them the gospel so they can be saved. And if we don't, who will? Cornelius needed Peter. The Ethiopian eunuch needed Philip. They weren't going to get it by themselves. God told Philip, go. I want you out there in the, in the middle of the wilderness. There's a guy over there who needs the gospel. Get over there quick. He didn't waste any time. He left the revival to get over here to witness to this guy who was a, sounded like probably a black guy. He was from Ethiopia. But you know what? He got saved. He baptized him that day because there wasn't any time to teach him anymore. And then Philip ended up in a different city, and that guy went on his way rejoicing. Rejoicing, full of joy, because he got salvation. God changed his life that day. And you know what happened in Ethiopia? That was the first country in Africa that was receiving the gospel. Why? Because God used Philip one day, and Philip was obedient. What about us? Can God use you? Are you going to be obedient when he tells you what to do? Whether you want to or not. I mean, I don't imagine Philip was enjoying running from here. You get over there. He didn't have a car. He didn't have a donkey even. He had to get there as quick as he could because there was a guy on a chariot. He was moving and he had to catch up with him. He said, join up with that chariot because I need him to hear the gospel. He's reading already the scriptures but doesn't understand them. There's a lot of your friends and neighbors that are reading the Bible, maybe. Or going to a church that says they read the Bible. But they don't understand. But if somebody would come and love them and guide them, you know what they'd understand? There is only one way. And I need Christ so I can get there. God could use you. I'm not going to turn to it because it'll be too long. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. You can open if you want to. It's a very interesting verse. Here Peter's talking, or Paul's talking about how that the Jews first trusted in Christ, and then we also trusted in Christ when? After that we heard the word of truth, the gospel of our salvation. Somebody gave you the word of truth. That was the gospel. The gospel was in that word of truth. I mean, every time we talk to people, we don't have to just, Jesus died for you, Jesus died for you. What we need to explain to them, the truth about God, that there is a God and we're going to stand before him one day. And as we give them that truth, the, the word of truth, then we give them the gospel too. And the gospel of your salvation could very easily become the gospel of their salvation. Because God brought us, brings us sinners, saved sinners, to those lost sinners so they can be saved. So God uses us. He said you've get, he's given you the ministry of reconciliation. Why? Because God already did everything for every man in this world to get saved. You can't take the gospel to the wrong address. God wants to send you and me to all those lost people. He gave us a ministry to reconcile people, to go out and help them get reconciled. It doesn't mean we reconcile them. We're Christ, the Savior, is the one to go between God said there's one God, one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Why is he the go-between? Because we couldn't even talk to holy God. He was holy God in a man's flesh. He could talk to God for us and he can talk to us and bring us to each other so we can be reconciled. That's what his work on the cross was for. And that's what he does still today. When does Jesus get to do his reconciliation work? I want you to think about this. Colossians 3 says this. It says, if ye, this is talking to us Christians, if ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. 
Set your affections on things which are above, right? Where Christ sitteth at the right hand of the Father. Why is Jesus sitting up there at the right hand of his Father? Let's say this is the throne of grace, the place where we can come and get saved. This is where people can come. The blood of Jesus Christ was already sprinkled on that mercy seat. So souls could be saved. And Jesus, after he finished his work as the, as the high priest, after he rose from the dead, he took his blood, went up there and sprinkled it before that throne. He came and sat down because he was finished. The work of re redemption was finished. And Jesus, the Bible says, he's alive forevermore to save unto the uttermost all that come unto God by him. He said he once suffered for all the just for the unjust to bring us to God. God wants to bring them to him through Jesus Christ. Jesus, remember, said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. He's the mediator. We just talked about that. He's the one that can get us reconciled to the Father, but he actually plays the role as an advocate. That person has to just come and confess that they're guilty. And then the, the lawyer will, ju will jump in and uh, I can't advocate for him. Thank you. I say it in Russian, but I can't say it in English sometimes. I do this more in Russian than I do in English, so it's easier to say it there. But right now, that's a challenge. When we go back right now, Brother Paul, myself, Brother Chris, we've got to learn Ukrainian. That's a bear. That's a new language. It's 38% similar, but it's different. And there's plenty of words we've got to learn, plenty of things in the structure of their language we've got to learn. So it's going to be fun. And there's, lot, there's people, the last time I was there in, in, Feb, in March, they said, would you mind using a translator? I'm like, oh, my goodness. I speak Russian. Everybody understands it. But because right now Russia is the aggressor and Russia is, you know, attacking Ukraine, nobody wants to speak Russian. The area where Brother Chris's church is and our church is and the city of Odessa, they're still speaking Russian. But most everybody who had to flee their homes, they don't want to hear Russian anymore. Those people attacked us. Don't talk to me in that language. And so they want us to speak to them in Russian, or in Ukrainian, in Ukrainian. So we've got to learn a new language. It's going to be fun. Praise God, they're voting soon to make English a second language. That'll help us a little bit. That'll mean more open doors. But they're, they're right now, everybody expects us to give them literature. We used to print 20% um, Russian, or 20% Ukrainian, and 80% and 80, 80 Russian. Now it's the other way around. 20% of it is now in Russian. And 80% is in Ukrainian because nobody wants those Russian ones. Just a few people are still using them. Most everybody wants us to give them Ukrainian, which is a bad thing. They don't have a really good Bible in Ukrainian, which there's work, guys working on it, but there's not a good one yet, which is going to be a big problem. But I want you to just pray for us for that reason. we got a lot of needs in that respect. I mean, I'm hoping I can learn the language pretty quickly, but that doesn't always work. This fall, we're going to move over to the West, like I showed you on the slides, and then when we get there, Everybody there speaks Ukrainian, so it'll be a lot of practice. But I want you to think, what am I going there for? Why would I want to learn a new language? Because I'm a fellow that can communicate to this person over here, this sinner that doesn't know, and point them, hey, you need to come over here. You need to come to God. God said you have to repent and turn. That's what happened to me, and I tell them how I got saved. And you need to come, and when you do, and you admit that you're a sinner, and that you need God's forgiveness... Jesus, the Savior who died and paid for you, will intercede for you so God can and will forgive you. You know what God's waiting for up in heaven? Not for your next prayer so much. But he is. He's going to answer your prayer. But he's waiting for you and me to have that desire to fulfill his will. His will is he said he's not willing that any, his, his will is that none perish, right? He's not willing that any should perish. He's long-suffering right now. He's putting up with these sinners down here. He could destroy them. He could kill anybody he wanted to, but he's putting up with them. Why? He's not willing that any of them perish, but that they all come to repentance and repent and believe the gospel. Repentance and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And we're the ones who did that once. We're the ones who can show them that's what God did for us when we turned and asked him for salvation. We got saved. If we tell them, the gospel of our salvation will become the gospel of their salvation. We're supposed to be pointing them to him. He's waiting. You know what's going to happen when this sinner repents that you bring to the Lord Jesus Christ? God's going to rejoice. Why? 
because the Bible says he's laboring and travailing, that they would be born again. And the, when it happens, the joy is so much that they forget the travail. They're just thankful and grateful. A new son is born. A new daughter got born today. They got born again. The Bible says there's joy in the presence of the angels. I think that's God rejoicing more than the angels. Because it was his plan to send Jesus to die for their sins. Who else is rejoicing? Jesus. Why? Because he said that he endured the cross for the joy that was set before him. He looked beyond that cross and said, hey, if I go to that cross, Brother Jeremiah will get saved. Tom Holt will get saved. Jeff Holt will get saved. All these people, all these souls will get saved. And when you get saved, he's rejoicing because his sacrifice wasn't in vain for your sake. He realizes, praise God. Hallelujah. He understood. He believed. He called. And now he's saved. And you know who else will be rejoicing? Remember that eunuch was rejoicing? That sinner will be rejoicing. But you know who will be rejoicing? You will be. You and I should, will have more joy if we ever get serious about what we're here for. Because I'll tell you what, there isn't any greater joy than that. When you lead somebody to Christ, whew, there's nothing better. And until you've done it, you think, well, I don't know. Don't give God that excuse. Peter said, well, we, we already worked all night. You know, we're tired. We don't want to do that. We don't want to throw those nets out there again. He wasn't happy with his excuse. And Peter was embarrassed of his excuse later. You'll be embarrassed of your excuse later. And I don't want you to have that. You can avoid that embarrassment by being obedient. And if you don't know how to lead somebody to the Lord, you, you're afraid to what to say. You don't have to know the answer to every question. You have to know the most important thing, that you're saved and how you got saved. And that if they'll call upon the Lord, they'll get saved. You need to know that most important thing. Yes, you should know your Bible. But I don't tell everybody I know every answer. If I don't know the answer, I'll say, I'll try to find it for you. And that's all you have to do. And you don't have to continue trying to find the answer for them this moment. Say, so I don't know the answer for that. I'll try to find it for you. But, you know, if we don't do anything, we're going to end up up there with empty hands. And that's going to be an embarrassing day. There's a song that says, must I go in empty, empty handed? I mean, with not one soul, not one soul to bring to him. Think about this. What can you take to heaven? We came in naked. We're going to go out naked. But if you laid up, have, laid up treasures in heaven, they're there. He said, moth and rust does not corrupt and no, no thief can break in there and steal anything you already put up in heaven. But when you think about that last verse on the uh, slide presentation, it says, he that goeth forth and weepeth, that's uh, soul winning, he that goeth forth and weepeth bearing precious seed shall doubtless, no doubt about it, come again rejoicing. You'll have joy why? You'll be bringing your sheaves with you. I believe when you go to heaven, your sheaves will be up there with you too because they got saved like you got saved and they'll be up there with you in heaven. There was a song years ago called Thank You for Giving Unto the Lord. Well, I believe there'll be even more thanks for every person that led somebody else to Christ. I'm thankful for those four guys who testified to me. I'm very thankful for each one of them. And I know God used them. Not one of them was there actually leading me to Christ. But God saved me that night because of their testimonies. And God will use your testimony if you'll use it. If you'll get out there and use it. Make a tract an open door. Don't make it your excuse for not telling them the gospel. You can use a tract as a, jaw, as a what do we call it, icebreaker. This is uh, tracks I want you to take back there on the table. This is Brother Paul's testimony and this is Sister Angela's testimony. When you give them to somebody... Tell them, this is what God changed, used to change my life. Why? Because the gospel that's in there, it should have changed your life if you believed it. It changed my life. And it doesn't have to be this particular tract, but the gospel's in each gospel tract. And it, this gospel tract can say, change their life. And when I give it to them, they say, well, I hope it changes my life. I know other ones will say, well, I'll read it then. They take it better because I didn't advertise, but I told them what it's about. I didn't just give them a piece of, pa piece of paper. I mean, not every cashier will take it with the same joy, but I've had them where they were saying, thank you. 
You ever had anybody tell you thank you for a tract? They will be thankful if they realize what it can do and what it is. And if you ask them, we read this? They will. I've also got some other stuff back there, the Evangel card, Evangel cube. I want you to take them not for my sake, but for your sake so you can be more effective when you reach out to souls because God wants to reach them with the gospel and he wants to use you. And God can do exceeding, not a little bit more, exceeding abundantly above all that you could ask or think according to the power of the spirit that's working in you. Amen.